you don't know luxury until you've had it and you you know you you don't have it so i mean right. i i grew up in what i called i thought was a normal situation but you know we didn't have um we didn't have heat we didn't have um um, a shower or a bathroom or a fridge or a washing machine or dryers or anything, the luxuries that you would be used to. And so as a kid, you don't know any different, but that's kind of like we, the way we grew up. I always kind of reflect back in the wintertime, you'd look up and you'd see uh, drops on the ceiling from the moisture condensing uh, ah. on, the, on the non-insulated <laughs> ceiling. So, um, you know, so for, for me, it was just one of those situations whereby you, you you didn't really know it until you got older and you started to see other houses and other people and stuff like that. So it was a typical row home close to the city. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was the beginning of the end of the uh, Cork uh, Corporation, which is the county um, facilities, if you want to call it, uh, building bathrooms in homes. They didn't have bathrooms in these homes. And wow. Then okay. you, go, you go one block up and all of a yeah. sudden the new bathrooms were in, but they weren't in our house. You know? <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. That, that was, I delineated old places versus new places. They had bathrooms or not. Yeah. I missed the cutoff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <sorry>. missed, the <laughs> cutoff, missed the cutoff for the bathroom. <laughs> what, what did your parents do? What, what kind of work? My dad was a fitter, fitter and turner, machinist. Uh, my mom didn't work. She was household, um, you know, housekeeper. Uh, mother raising kids and um you know it was kind of um just like a regular family not untypical of what you would see in turner's cross yeah were there aspirations like i want to get out of here someday i want to do something different with my life or was this kind of like you assumed i'm from cork i'll always be in cork i i think as a kid i i started to begin to realize we didn't have much i i started to begin to realize that i wanted more I just wasn't sure academically I wasn't going to be inclined to go to college and you could kind of see that, you know, I was the type of kid that you were going to leave high school in the middle and get uh, an apprenticeship and be a carpenter or electrician or plumber or something like that, which is not untypical. Um, I ended up finishing high school and um, I think the thing that kind of saved me is I just got into running and that was totally by chance. And there's a seven year old, I used to go on long walks with my father, and and um, on Sundays he would take everyone out. We didn't have a car. That's right. another. That's another thing we didn't okay. have. Okay. Wow. Right. So we would go on long walks on Sunday, and during the during the walks, it was it was right around the um, seventy two Olympics. And um, I remember saying to my dad, "Do you think I could make the Olympic team? I'm not even involved in sports. I'm You're like seven, seven years old. old. I'm seven yeah, or eight yeah. years old. Talk about prophetic, and and, right? and so uh, he, you know, kind of the way he would entertain me, he would say, "You know what? Hold on a sec here now. I mean, you know." You know, 76, no, forget about it. 80 is going, you're just going to be a little bit too young. But 84, uh, that's a good year. I think you could make the Olympic team in 84. Huh. And so he planted this kind of seed in me that I kept, um, you know, thinking about. But I never, we never spoke about it again. It was a one and done conversation at a corner of a road that was right across from the milk factory. Remember it like it was yesterday. And all of a sudden that's I began incredible. to think that maybe I could make the Olympic team. And so the first thing I had to do was join a club. So I went down to the local running club. Um, I showed up that night. I was really small for my age. If you saw some photographs, I am exceptionally small. Really? Okay. And so I, I go down to the club and I'm, I'm going out for some wind sprints. And uh, Mr. O'Brien, great guy, but I've known him ever since then, kind of says, oh, uh, Marcus, you know, you, you're, why don't we put you in with the girls tonight? You know, and so as a young boy, that's, that's, you know, that's insulting enough for me as a young kid growing up. And then all of a sudden to add insult to injury, I got beaten by every girl in every wind sprint. So I left, I left that night and decided that I wasn't going to go run. Uh, a couple of years later, um, I'm in, I'm in middle school and, um, primary school, middle school. And, uh, one of the brothers came around looking for volunteers for the cross country team. And, you know, I sat in the back of the class and I put my hand up and I said, uh, brother Canisius, uh, I'll come out for the team. And what made you make that decision to actually try again? Because it sounds like you kind of wrote. Written... I, I, I reluctantly. I put my hand up. They're looking for volunteers. Okay. I put my hand up, and all of a sudden he said, "You know, cross country is tough, Mr. Sullivan, and uh, I don't know if it's the sport for you." So he tried to talk you out of it. Yes. Sat down. Totally rejected, and just like like I can't even make the volunteer squad. <laughs> so um, it wasn't until my freshman year in high school. Um, we had a brother, uh, Mr. Bernard, B Bernard Martin, and he was a PE teacher and he came around and he basically, the freshman class, he came around and he said, unless you can tell me you are physically incapable of running, which means I need to see a doctor's note. 
I want everybody out for the trials tomorrow. Wow. Okay. So I was thrilled. I mean, I was absolutely thrilled. So I went out there the next day. I didn't have any shoes or anything. I just ran around the field on my bare feet. And we, you know, it was bedlam. It, you know, it was like, it was like uh, NASCAR at Bristol where you don't know where the cars are anymore. They just <laughs> yeah, keep yeah, on right, going right. around. And so finally, I, 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 uh, I, I, somebody grabs me by the shoulder in, in oxygen debt and says, hey, number four, you're on the team. And, and essentially that is how I got introduced to running. So it was just the luck of the draw and I was right there at the right time and I got an opportunity and from there I ran in high school the whole time. Never to be the best in high school. Really? Never won a field day in high school, you know, um, and um, my claim to fame is I did win the slow bicycle race one time, which I don't know if anyone's familiar with the slow bicycle race. slow bicycle race? race. No, I've never. You go from, you go from whatever, wherever the start is and it's about 50 meters and whoever gets their last wins. (laughs) Try that without touching the ground. (laughs) So you gotta you gotta not touch the ground and you gotta bike as slow as you possibly can. And wow. I won that. You won, so I must yeah. have had a great sense of balance. So anyway, um, uh, that was it. That was it for me. I, I got done. I got done secondary school and um, and then I was not going to go to college. Okay, uh, so you wouldn't even go to college. So no, no, at this point, no, I'm not going to college. Yeah. I'm, I'm reading. I'm reading the papers and I'm looking for something. And all of a sudden, something pops up and it's a job placement program to. Um, mending nets and fishing and all sorts of good stuff like that and i said what the heck i might as well do that which led me to kinsale so you're like what, about 18 at this time and you're i'm, I'm 17 18 so that was like the long game at that point is i'm going to stay here in ireland going to work on sales and i mean was there some impetus of like sure and, and i'll tell you what it was yeah. i knew that north sales were based in michigan and i knew they were based in san diego and so all of a sudden I had this, wow, I could become a sailmaker. I could get my way to San Diego. So every time I go out to San Diego and I go out there yearly, I'm always thinking I could be here and it might be for a total different career. But anyway, um, you know, Kinsale became my home for a year. And while all that was going on, I was so fortunate enough to meet um, a man by the name of Donald Walsh. Donald Walsh went to Villanova, graduated in 1972, came back to Ireland um, became an Olympian, happened to be at a, the club I was affiliated with by now, Lee Vale. And um, he took me under his wing for a year. And during that year, I would come home from work. I would literally get up at seven. I would take the bus down to Kinsale, which was about an hour ride. You wow. Know. Okay. I would work for the day. I would take the bus home. Like at this point, you're 17. Imagine you're getting your first full-time job. I was exhausted. I would go to bed, have dinner, go to bed at about five o'clock. Get it was all manual labor all day. It is. And yeah. get up at seven uh, in the evening and yeah. then go to the club and Donnie would meet me and we would run. And that went on for a whole year. I would come home at 10 o'clock, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, have like these fried, greasy bacon sandwiches on toast, cup Sounds of tea. Sounds delicious. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> and, and, and go right to bed. And that went on for a whole year with no real expectations of whether I was going to make it or not. I just had a dream and the dream might be at this point, I was beginning to think I could get to America either by being a sailmaker or maybe this running thing could work out. So one or the other. I'm curious, like, what do you think Donnie saw in you? If you were, sound like you weren't the best runner, but there's something about you that he thought, this is someone I want to take under my wing. What do you think that was? Because that sounds like something kind of remarkable to have happen. You know what? I, I, don't, I don't know. I, you know what? He was with me this weekend. He came over from Ireland. He was spending the weekend with me. And I, you know, I'm going to ask him that the next time because I never, you never really think about going back and asking what it is that he saw. Right. But I do remember one particular night and it was pouring rain. And I took it upon myself that I can't run in this rain. I mean, keep in mind that we don't have a washer dryer. <laughs> Most of my clothes are being dried by a, a gas. We had yeah. what you call a gas fire. So you're not like so a high maintenance person. I'm not, I'm not very high. And, and so my clothes would start to dry from the salt that would dry out in the clothing after a while because you keep drying them every night from the sweat. And so you dry them in front of this um, oh um, propane tank little fire that I had in my room. Uh, we upgraded, by the way, since the last time I said we had no heat. We had a little bit of heat now and it was... Um, um, it was gas. And I would dry the clothes there. So I said, man, this is going to be pelting rain tonight. And sure enough, 8 o'clock, a knock came to the door. And there was Donny. I call him Donny, Donald Walsh. She's outside the door, and he's got these yellow oilskins. He's like somebody from the North Sea, you know, out there fishing. <laughs> he's got all the yellow oilskins on. And he says, um, well, you're not going to run tonight? 
And I said, uh, well, I wasn't thinking about it. And he goes, I'll give you five minutes. I got to keep warm, so I'll keep running, and I'll come back, pick you up. Wow. So he was out there running. He was already out there. And you know what? Those moments, I cherish them because I think they gave me definitive direction as to where I was going to go. Um, and magnificently, I, I realized years later, he was a phenomenal coach. Donnie used to ho- hang with bookies and gamblers, loved racing, <laughs> would take me to the Greyhound tracks as the years went on. You'd have to meet him at the Greyhound track while he's betting on dogs. He'd be like telling me about training. So I would have to go to the bar to get all that. They, the they, knowledge. I would get right, all the, right. the bar to get the knowledge and I got yeah. to know all these bookie friends when they were in there. <laughs> So it was but, Trek University in the bar, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pub. So, so uh, you know, the year went by, and and all of a sudden, I just blossomed, and something magnificent happened, and and before you know it, I'm I'm on my way to Villanova. I got twenty bucks in my pocket, a bag full of clothes, and I bought the airline ticket with the money I'd saved that year, and and at that point, there was no turning back. At that moment, you know, when you say you had this like pivotal moment where you blossom, do you remember what that was? Where things start to change for you, like where you're like, oh my god, all of a sudden. I, I, I could I think, be this. I, I think it was physically getting stronger. That's the first thing, because I was really yeah. small for my age. I think the other thing is I was putting a lot of consistent, and I, I think the word is consistent, training in over time. And and I'd made the World Cross Country that winter in Longchamps in France. First time I was ever on a plane. And I was like, all right, so I got this far. And then by the time we got to the summer, I was really starting to emerge. What I What I didn't see myself being was a miler and in the in the process of that year i always considered myself a cross-country runner a distance runner and then all of a sudden with growing and get a little bit taller and get a little bit stronger i i I actually discovered i had some speed and and in the midst of all of that i emerged as being a kind of a decent miler by the end of that year which changed the whole trajectory because at that point my vision was to go to a place like providence rhode island which was big back then in cross-country and then all of a sudden, I, I redirected it. And um, when Villanova reached out to me sometime early August, which was really late in the game, yeah, uh, they said they had a spot and if you want it. And, and, and I, knew, I knew in my heart Jumbo didn't want me because I was too small. Um, and, um, but, I, but I went anyway. And um, I, think, I, I think something that happened that year was Jumbo uh, realized when he saw me he had said, and this is posthumously, he because he passed away that year. I became really, really good friends with his close friend, Dr. Ted Barry, who had written the book, written the book about Jumbo. And he said, when Jumbo saw you, he said, you'll be one of his great ones. Now, I find all this out after he passes away, but it's amazing when somebody gives you a stamp. And I always kind of say this to people, when somebody can give you a stamp of approval and they have the uh, the repertoire of of people that they've worked with and they'll tell you this is it a lot of people can't tell you they can always tell you what it isn't they can never really sure yeah. tell you what it is and and i don't mean running i mean in anything in in careers and in, in everything and the it thing was something that i think jumbo knew what it was when he felt it and saw it and so after he had passed away um dr ted barry had said to me because i got friendly with with dr barry and he said you know what when jumbo saw you he didn't he said at the moment he saw you run, he said, you, you, you're going to be good. And I believed in that. And so you leave Villanova always thinking yeah. that I, I've got expectations here. Um, and this was after somebody had passed away and kind of left his stamp behind. You don't know what Jumbo actually really said. You know, for all you know, uh, the hearsay that he said, this is one of the great ones. And it kind of reminds me of what your dad said to you when you were younger, that you know, you'll be ready for the 84 Olympics. It's almost in a way... If you just hear something you need to hear at the right time, and whether it's true or not, if you can buy into it. And, and, and that's, a, that's a, a really good example of you can say the same thing in the wrong time and it doesn't work. Right. And you can say the same thing at the right time and it works. And that's timing. And, and I, I think that's all part of uh, the integrative forces that make people who they are. Sometimes being at the lowest point in your career, the lowest point in your life, is the time when you're most receptive to something like that. Um, and it's usually never when you're at the height of your career. Right. Um, and so a lot of times it's, it's the, you have to have the right moment where you want to change, you want to do something, you want to believe. And then when it's said, it's like, you're going to grab it anyway, whether it's true or not. And like you said, whether it's even folklore or it never was said, but he just <laughs> interpreted it that way. 
And and that's I, I guess that's the beauty in many ways of of looking back retrospectively and just kind of like saying, wow, that hadn't happened, this wouldn't have happened, if this happened, and you know everything, you know. Yeah. If I had not lost my job, I wouldn't be in that bar that night. I wouldn't have met this person. And it's amazing. I'm always interested in what people do because I'm always curious to know how they got there. And so a lot of times you trace back and you kind of peel the layers back until you find that moment where that was the moment. But it might have been two years prior, you know. Yeah. What was it like? What were your first impressions of coming to America? Crazy. I, when I got to JFK, there was a man by the name of Cullen Clancy. Cullen Clancy passed away some years ago and I became friends with Cullen and his wife Maureen and Cullen was probably 6'4". He felt like he was bigger, you know. Uh, and he was one of Jumbo's very first athletes. He offered to come and meet me at the airport, put me in a van and send me off to Villanova. So he's my first imprint when I get to New York. This huge, it almost like Scandinavian looking, but he was from uh, Mayo in Ireland and uh, had come over to Villanova in the 40s after being at the 48 Olympics. Wow. And um, so uh, Cummins puts me on the van and we're driving down and all of a sudden I see the Verrazano Bridge and I go, oh my God, it's the Golden Gate Bridge. Like I didn't know where the Golden Gate Bridge was, but it looked like the <laughs> Golden Gate Bridge and I thought it was the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> and so a couple of hours later you arrive at Villanova and it, 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 was, it was different. I, I, I have to admit I was lonely when I got there, um, but I also knew we were coming out of a tough economic period of time in Ireland in the 80s. Yeah. Um, it was a struggle. And so I knew there was no going back at that point. I knew I had to make it. I'd never been to, never thought I was ever going to go to college. So that was really freaking me out. And so what I would end up doing, I was just, there was no way I was failing out. I would literally go to the library all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and I would just study and study and study. And then I got wow. to the first round of exams and I actually like, wow, it's not that bad. It's not that <laughs> difficult. And somehow, again, with my running, I think, and I always say this to young kids, a lot of times you've got to be patient in your growth. And I think sometimes people expect academia, just like athletics, to just arrive. And it doesn't. It just sometimes everyone develops and blossoms at different periods of time. And so sometimes people develop earlier than others. And, yeah. and sometimes people lose confidence, momentum. Um, they lose the, the, the um, they kind of just flat out lose the confidence in themselves. And the window passes. Sure. And so a lot of times I always try to encourage people in anything they do is, is to really like just be patient and sometimes your time will come. And for me, the running came late and the academics came late. And once I got to college, I actually, I actually kind of didn't mind it at all. I, I loved the experience of the exam. I loved the experience. So of, interesting. It was like, yeah. you know, um, I was driving my daughter to school one day when she was a kid in high school. And, and I said, do you get butterflies when you go take your exams? And uh, she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, and you, 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 what, what do you feel like? And he goes, it's just me against the teacher. That's all. And I was like, I was, I was blown away by her interpretation of what the exam meant to her. It was a competition. It was a competition, yeah. And, and it, it, it kind of like, for me, it, it felt like that also. And um, as school went on, I, 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 I was really more concerned about making sure I did well in school. And actually, at the time when Jumbo passed away, less about the running aspects of things. Interesting. Were you thinking to yourself at that point, I need to be financially independent? I mean, because obviously you can't go back to Ireland. Uh, I'm assuming, you know. I always wanted to have financial independence. Yeah. It is amazing how much I wanted it so much. And you can call it whatever kind of money you want to call it. There's a lot of terms for it. Um, but it was one of those things where I wanted to be able to walk away from anything I ever did or every, anything that I was doing. And the only way you could do that was to create some financial independence for yourself. And I knew intuitively that was what I wanted to do. Um, and so when I, when I got out of college, I, I, I met some great people. You know, you, you do your 101 with, you, you, you know, I went on to do my MBA. I was in the middle of my CFA. I, I got really into the academics. You got really into the academics. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and so, um, you know, the first thing I got out of college, I sat with a, a professor, Burke Ward, who was one of my previous professors. And... You know, he basically set me up, did my first tax return with me and kind of said, we are going to open a retirement plan right now. No way. Right now. Right. Yeah. First year when I got out of college. Because I imagine you probably knew nothing about that. Not, not that enough. Was. Not enough at the time. And there were Keo plans back then. Sure. Um, I, I don't think they have them anymore, but I don't know if they do or like not. The, the modern day SEP. The, SEP. Right. This modern day yeah. SEP. And so, um, 
And and you know what you learn about compounding and you learn about interest rates and you do all that in had a great professor you kind of remember all these people Dr Clark and money and capital markets you you kind of remember all that stuff, but until you have money you don't really care, right? right. True. And so right. all of a sudden you have a little yeah. bit of money and all of a sudden you go all right now now I need to figure this thing out quick and and that's what I ended up ended up doing. Just always saving no matter what. Yeah. yeah. Which is funny because you think you're thinking about financial independence, yet right out of college, you went into a professional running career. Rumor has it, that's not a way to make a lot of money. You know what? It's, it, it's not. I did well. Like I will say, I will, I will not tell you I didn't. I did, I did right. pretty well. Um, we're, we're not right off the bat, I would imagine. No, right? not it's, right, it's right not off like, the bat. Yeah. In, in fact, um, I remember I was at the Olympic Games and uh, this was in 19, I made the team in 1984, just like my dad predicted. Wow. And um, I'm, I'm trying to get a shoe contract. Now, there was no agents. There was no managing. Everyone was on their own. This was pioneering, fly by the seat of your pants, that kind of stuff. And um, I, I, I couldn't nail a contract down with a particular company. And um, they were kind of hedging. And, and, and back then, and, and it still holds through today, is once you declare your shoes for the Olympics, you can't change. So I knew the days were coming up. I had about two days left. And um, um, I... I just said, I'm desperate here. I can't get a contract. I have no money coming in, nothing coming in. And I remember um, a, a guy by the name of Kevin Ryan walked into the, my, 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 the village and um, he had a bag full of clothes. And in the bag was a New Balance uh, bag full of all sorts of stuff. And this was in the company I planned to go with. And so I checked him out really quickly. Background, great guy, stand-up guy. And uh, Kevin said, I have no money for you right now, but I promise I'll give you a contract in January. So I asked, is, is this guy's word good? And the word came back, it was good. And so at the 11th hour, I said, let me take the bag of clothes then. I put them on. The other company were upset. Um, why, I don't know, because they weren't. Yeah, they were they, we wouldn't even negotiated anything. And um, that was the beginning of an eight-year an eight relationship with New Balance um, and made all the difference. And so a lot of times you're you're right on the verge of something going one way and 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 you can kind of pivot and go in a different direction. So I find that I, I met a lot of those moments, and I always seem to be able to manage to do the best thing at the time, at the particular particular time, you know. Um, and, and then from there, I, I was very, very fortunate. I went 15 years professionally, two seasons a year back-to-back, -back. so I went 30 seasons, never missing one. So I was a consistent, what you call a, um, um, a, a consistent earner, um, I carved out a great profession indoors um, in in the U.S. and and kind of from there, it led to a, a kind of a, a business, if you will, if you want to. And so I was I was very very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time, and and I always seem to be able to take the advice from people that were always trying to give me good advice. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 153, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, and you want a more hands-on approach, Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. This is what we do every single day. We'll put together for you a total financial master plan. We'll do a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. In fact, we'll build you your own personalized financial portal. We'll go through and look at everything you need from an income plan for retirement. How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you take social security? We'll do a full deep dive of your total portfolio. Look at your diversification. Have you had way too much money in the market? Have you seen your portfolio go up and down like a yo-yo or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do? We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, tie it to your goals, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, insurance product, structured product, brokerage product. We'll do a deep dive of all those investments, show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's now what you make. It's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. If you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click on the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. But how do you discern between, because it sounds like you, you picked the right people when it came to your financial situation to give you good advice. 
um, you know, obviously with Dunny was an amazing uh, mentor to you yeah. in Ireland. Do you think you have a good ability to discern between who's giving you good advice versus bad advice? I do. I do. I, I think I, I, because I, I always ask the question, why are you doing this? Uh, why are you doing it? Have you got something to gain from this? And a lot of times, if you don't, the chances are you're genuinely trying to help you. And it starts with your parents. Your parents are the first people that actually try to help you, right? Right. Um, but not necessarily. Like a lot of parents will well, for live. For the right reasons. A lot of people, parents will vicariously try to live through their kids. So they're telling you to do something. You know, my daughter always says, I'm, she's a veterinarian. My, she goes, I'm, I'm a veterinarian mom because it's your dream. You know, I'm living your dream. Great. You know, <laughs> she's, I mean, she's kidding. She's kidding half the time, but she's not the other half, <laughs> yeah. you know, this is the one that likes to There's be competitive with the teacher. Yeah. Check. She's got a cutting edge for her. So, um, but, um, having said that, um, I, I think for the most part, people genuinely try to want to help you. Um, and I think I was pretty good at being able to take the advice that I, I felt was timely and, 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 and and, and the right. And I always say people have different perspectives. And perspective is a great word I use a lot. And I'm, I kind of do a little bit of farming over the years. I, I and, know. You're um, a farm. That's right. And yeah. so I always, try to, I always try to give the analogy of you, if, you, if you walk through a, a zucchini patch and you're, you're picking the zucchini patch all the way up the field. And my, our, our lines could be, you know, 100 yards long and you, you're, you're picking them. And you get to the end of the zucchini patch and you've, you've got like 10 bushels of zucchinis, right? And you think you have them all. And you're so proud of yourself. And you get to the top of the field and you turn around and you look back and you see all the zucchinis that you've missed because <laughs> the leaves have covered them from the direction that you were coming in. And I think it's a great analogy in life. It depends on where you're standing. Yeah, it's all that perception. you can see things. And so perception is one of those things where you're standing at a different place than I am, Bob. You're standing at a different place where you are. Um, and so a lot of times, it's what do you see that I can't see? I remember years ago, um, a lesson, one of the greatest lessons I ever learned was, was coming out of my house. And it, it turns out Frankie Farrell. Frankie Farrell was the managing director of Man United back in the 70s. And he was walking by my house. His sister happened to live around the corner. He came from England to visit her. And he said, ah, you, you had a, I was in Cork for a race. And he said, you had a bad run that last night. And I, yeah, I did. And he said, yeah, I was reading in the paper this morning. You got, you know, you got yeah. kind of, you know, scored a little bit, you know, scoring. And he said, can I give you some advice? And I said, yeah, absolutely. You know, and he said, today's newspaper is tomorrow's fish and chip wrapper. And don't ever forget that. <laughs> and it, it stuck with me like unbelievable. Line. And from yeah. that moment on, because it hurts. You know, even as a, an athlete, you're reading what's in the paper. You believe what's in the paper. And so I stopped reading it. I never I stopped reading articles, stopped reading everything, good or bad. And I think social media today is, is, is 100 times magnified. It is, totally. it is just blown apart. And I think the vulnerability that you end up finding yourself in is that you start listening to everything. And so I think the people you listen to have to be the correct ones and they have to be the mentors and they have to be the steadfast people that are in your corner. They're nobody the ones, else. Everything, nobody else. Yeah. They're the ones said. they're yeah. the ones that are gonna help you the most. And you respect the fact that you can't see everything. You have blind spots and you have people you Absolutely. trust that can tell you what those blind spots are. I mean that it takes a lot to do that because I think we all have ego and a lot of times we don't want to know what our blind spots are, but it sounds like you really embraced I have these blind spots and I want to fix them, which sure. I think is a really interesting characteristic. Sure. It, it, I mean, it's very hard to be, it's very hard to be, um, it's, it's very, it's very, very hard to take criticism. Yeah. Most people don't want to take it. And I, I remember there was a guy for years, he'd, he'd call me every Monday, right? But let's call him Joe. Joe would call me every Monday. Uh, no, let's call him Doug. His name is Doug, right? <laughs> Doug would call me every, Doug would call me every Monday. <laughs> And I would get to the point, like he was, why aren't you recruiting this guy? Why, aren't, why don't you have this? How come you lost this? How come you did this? How come you did that? How come you did that? To the point where I was absolutely, why do I have this guy calling me on Monday? Why yeah. do I take his calls? And so finally, I'm at, I'm at the brink of like, I'm done. I'm done with Doug. I am going to tell Doug, don't ever call me again. And instead, I decided to say, Doug, I'm going to let you shadow me for a year. I'm going to, I'm going to confide in you what happens, what takes place through the process, right? So and so Doug said, all right, so we get to the point where why aren't you recruiting this kid? I called. 
the guy says, I'm not interested. I can't get him in because of academics. Um, it's not a right fit because of this, this, and this. I can't put the financial package together. Um, and we went through the whole year of him explaining, you know, why didn't you anchor this kid? Why didn't you do this? This is a, he's, he's a kind of a, a, a track, a fiction idol, if you want to call it. Got it. Right? Who, who likes to play and, money, just, money quarterback. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Totally. And so, and, and so at the end of the year, he said, I never, ever truly realized how difficult it is. And then he finished by saying, you're absolutely screwed. <laughs> You know, it's just... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. And we have since been yeah. very cordial. We talk um, less so, but more occasionally. But but sometimes you have to be willing to let somebody in to really find out what's wrong. And that's that's not easy. You know, it takes time and it takes energy. It's a lot of vulnerability. And vulnerability, totally. You're totally yeah. exposed. But, but you can learn a lot from it. And, um, you know, I remember I learned so much from my kids. My kids were on the team with me and the kids, my, my daughter came in one day and he said, dad, you need to understand not everyone loves the sport the way you love it. Interesting. And once you can capture that, you'll be okay. There's nobody in your workforce. There's nobody in your team. There's nobody that will walk in and tell you that unless they are absolutely, totally protected. And yeah. what better protection than you have that is being a daughter, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, that's your, right. that's your coat yeah, of armor yeah. right you there. Yeah, you yeah. can say whatever you wouldn't want to your, your own daughter, yeah. right? And she does. And so a lot of times you learn a lot as a parent, you learn a lot by just listening to your kids when, if yeah. it's genuine and it's true. So you have both sides. You have parents and you have, um, how do we get into this? Parenting and uh, <laughs> kids. Marcus, it sounds like a lot of things that you did in your life really involved being a self-starter. I mean, is that kind of how you define yourself? Do you feel like you, you've always been a self-starter? I don't know if I'm a self-starter. Um, as much as I am maybe a survivor. Um, and I think there's a difference. You know, I always say there's a difference between, you know, I, and I always, I, I analyze this maybe a little bit over much, but um, there's athletes that win because they want to win. And there's athletes that win because they can't afford to lose. There's a big difference between the two. And I think you're the latter. I was the latter, yeah. and it, it's, it's probably somewhat dysfunctional to operate like that because there's a tremendous amount of anxiety. There's a tremendous amount of, of, of worry that goes along with it. While the other person, the former, I want to win because I want to win. It's that appetite. It's that drive. It's greed. You can call it what you want. It's, it's everything. The other one is more, yeah. I need to do yeah. this. It, this is, this is something yeah. I can't afford to lose. But Marcus, you know, you find you're, you're coaching a lot of great athletes and, and so a couple of things, I have a couple of questions. You know, first, how many how many of these kids have you told they have it? That they're going to be the one. You know what? Uh, I, 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 first of all, you're never quite sure when you say it, right? Um, and I'll give you an example. Liam Murphy, who anchored this weekend for uh, the Penn Relays that yeah, we had. Congratulations. Had, which yeah. team won? Um, you know, I had a conversation with Liam, and, I, and I, I, I think it'd be forthcoming to say it. A couple of years ago, I had a conversation with Liam and sat in my office and I, I'm going to put it in the terms I put it. I said, Liam, you're an enormous disappointment. <laughs> right now that was, and I knew it hurt and I knew it pinched him and I took a big chance uh, because you can drive a person away at that point or you can get them to ante up. Does it depend on the person? It depends on the person and you can make a mistake and that's not my, what my, my intention would have been. Sure. But I decided to go and, you know, throw a Hail Mary pass. First, he was frustrating me. Um, and I, um, I, just, I, I just said, I think you're it. And I think you have it. And I don't want you to be 40 years old looking back, wow. wishing you had done this and done that. And I get those. I, I get people that come back and say, I wish I could do it all over again. I wish I, you know. And I left it at that. There was no more to be said. He went home that summer, and I knew when he came back in September, he was a different guy. I wasn't really caring about how good Liam could be. I was caring about him being the best he could possibly be. For himself. And learning that methodology and learning that those traits that when you go on and you, you, you get married and you're raising a family, you're trying to be the best father, the best husband, the best whatever it is that you're trying to do, would you, whatever career you get into, I want to just do the best. I want to just show up. Yeah. And, and it's amazing what happens if you just show up. 
a lot of people don't even realize that, but just showing up for work, showing up for the game, showing up for the day, showing up for whatever it is, it is an enormous characteristic that a lot of people do not have. But when you do have it, you're there long enough, often enough to start seeing things happening. And yeah. all of a sudden, you make the luck because you are there. People call, oh, you were there. You were there that particular day. Yeah, I was there every day. Every day. You know? And I, and I think they're the lessons that I try to impart with, with, young, with young men. And, and I, I get a thrill out of when I see somebody flourishing just simply because they show up and they do their, they do their job, you know? Yeah, Mark, as I find, <clears throat> I did a little bit of training in my career. And I think the biggest shock in my career was that everybody didn't think the way I did. Um, when it came to investing or building your practice, and I think as a world-class runner, I wondered at what point did you realize that Ed, everybody thinks the way you do about running, competing, you know, effort. Did you always know that? Did you always have that perspective or did you, did you have to learn that from coaching? My first year of coaching, I learned it. I, I, I genuinely learned that I didn't realize I was that competitive and focused and, and I didn't realize how uncompetitive people were. I'm not talking about you, Ryan. You're the That's exception careful. here. Careful. You're the exception Obviously. here. <laughs> but, but and, 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 and so I've learned to live with that. that um, and I always, I, I mean this in the most genuine sense um, with athletics, particularly through the medium of athletics, is that you need the people that will show up every day. Yeah. They have to be part of your steadfast group. But you also need the people that go above and beyond. And I always say with athletes, sometimes they want it all, you know? Yeah. You know, and, there, and there's athletes that want to be guaranteed the podium spot before they even start training. In fact, they won't even train until they know they can make the podium. Yeah. And I go, well, what, well, where yeah. does that get you? I mean, the whole idea is the uncertainty. Right. The journey is the the journey is the path. The journey, the journey is the, is the yeah. best part. Yeah. And you can't be guaranteed anything. You shouldn't be guaranteed anything because there's no fun if it isn't. That's there's no, there's no, you know, so like at the end of the day, I, I, I've coached guys that I know in their heart and soul, they, they can't coat. They can't do what they need to do because they're not sure they'll get on the podium. And if they're not going to be guaranteed a podium spot, there's no point in doing it. Which is crazy. Right. No, no You're right. Totally. Yeah, totally. it's all about chance. Life's about chance. It, totally. And, yeah. and so I always say, with everything in life, you got to really enjoy the journey. you got to enjoy the trip. Because there's no sense. Because it, whether it happens, whether it comes to fruition or not, whether you end, the end result is the win or the non-win, you got to be able to say, but I enjoyed the journey. And I always mm -hmm. say, I've, I've never had any problem with, you know, those athletes that are there every day. They may not have the the hundred percent or the over the top commitment that I'm expecting, but they're there for you every day. Right. And I also then understand that you need the ones that can close the deals. Like I call them the anchor legs, the people that can win for you and, but they need the support of everybody else. And I think so it's, 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 I've learned over the years that it, it, it's a, it's a, um, it's a makeup of different people that, mm -hmm. that make your team. And I think you have to be very careful and sensitive and, 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 um, and as a coach, uh, you have to be very thoughtful. And so a lot of times if I'm angry or if I'm upset, it is the last moment that you should be it, talking to somebody. Right. You need to go away. You need to sleep on things. Yeah. I'll always say to kids, we just take a night's sleep. We'll talk about it in the morning. Like, and because in the morning you've calmed down, you first of all you've talked to your wife and she tells you how crazy you are, and then <laughs> and then and then you have a much more rational discussion the next day. And totally. that's no different than being a manager. That's no different. Yeah. I always I always kind of say what you guys do managing money or managing you're managing people. Less about managing yeah. money. You're man you're coaching people. Yeah. You're actually trying to get them to yeah. buy into the ideas yeah. of of training, if you want to call it that. <laughs> Um, and so all my style of training is very counterintuitive. Yeah. How can the yeah. slow stuff make you fast, right? So you're trying to explain to them how to slow make you fast, and it's physiologically why it happens. But you have to go through a lot of details, and it takes time, and it takes thoroughness. And so I always felt like they, they, I, I, I think, 
I, I feel like I'm a natural enough coach that I could have been a natural enough helper of people to find their way in the path of financial security and the path of financial growth. Yeah. Because really what it is, and I've always thought about this, it's coaching, you know, and, and sometimes you have difficult clients and sometimes you have really patient clients and sometimes you have really cooperative clients and you have a whole bunch of, it's your team. And, and, yep. and the creativeness is trying to find ways to get them to understand and going back to that timely thing, it That's has to be point. at the, it has to be at the right time when yes. they are open that window of, of reception of what you're trying to tell them. And so a lot of times it's really you're different. Yeah. You're probably, you're probably more concerned about what's going on in their life right now. Is this the right time to have a conversation about this? 100%. Because if it isn't, then you're going to lose and you're not going to have the receptive window that's open. If that makes sense. I mean, yeah. and the same with coaching. There's a lot of times I want to say things. I need to say things, but it's timing and the timing isn't right. So I'll sure. wait a week. I'll wait two yeah. weeks and then I'll say it. Yeah. Or there are things you could say to people maybe a couple of years ago in your coaching, you can't say to them today or vice versa. It's, Absolutely. It's, those things, you always have to know which way the wind's blowing Absolutely. that way. It's yeah. a great point. Totally. Totally. Yeah. totally. Which is interesting because we're talking about this. When I ran at Villanova, I was the first team that you coached. And initially, you didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, you <laughs> know, weren't shy about we, it. We were talking this pre-show that like, you know, <laughs> tell me what you really thought back then. <laughs> And and so 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 you know and I'm and I'm 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 interested in many ways because I I was angry I was um, it was not what I wanted to do I, once I got into the the idea of of academics I and the running my running career went way longer than I thought it was ever going to go I gave it three years I used incredibly to do, long I used to do career. three year adjustables on my mortgage because I would leave I would think I'd leave when the contract was done and we could figure things out after that Wow so five mortgages later. Um, and 15 years, um, I, I was at this critical point in my life where I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. But at the same time, I prepared. I was, I'd was, i gone back to do my MBA. I'd finished my CPA. I was in the middle of my CFA when when the job opportunity came. And so, you know, you know, a few of the people, Jerry O'Reilly was one of them that I sat and talked with and had a conversation with. Yeah. Jack Brennan was a good friend back then. Um, at the time when he was running Vanguard. And he was yeah. running Vanguard. And I remember meeting him at 6 a.m. in the morning. We were having some coffee and we were going over some stuff. And I was really looking for a mentor. I was yeah. looking for a job. I was looking for a mentor, a career, a, a path. And, uh, you know, I was talking about different things. I was interviewing with people. Not, I wouldn't call them interviewing. I would call them chatting and talking you know, to see what direction I wanted yeah. to go in. And once Jack found out it was a coaching opportunity, he goes, are you crazy? You got to take the coaching opportunity. He says, just take the coaching opportunity, try it for a few years, come back to me if you don't like it. And so I decided Tom Donnelly was another, my coach. And, and, and so you, you kind of, you're looking to see what they see that I can't see. And what they have is perspective. And they have a different, they have a different look of yeah. who I am as opposed to who I think I am. And so they felt it was a good match. Um, however, after the first year, I was, and we had won an NCAA title with the women. We were doing really well. We were building yeah. the men's No program. thanks to us. You were, yeah. you, were, uh, you, were, you were one of my first uh, guys that I coached. I was miserable. I mean, I was rock bottom. Like, I've made a huge mistake, and I, I wish I hadn't done this. Why? Was it because, going back to what we said earlier about the financial independence, I mean, you obviously got your CPA, you had your MBA. Were you really looking to, to leverage it up in terms of what you could do yeah, professionally and, I, and, I was, and outside was, of sport? Or, I mean, what, what, what was the... What was it about coaching that just was? Yeah, I don't know if it was the financial independence back then as much. I was I was gaining financial independence at that time, so I I was pretty comfortable. I right, your career thought. did well. Yeah, and and, and so I, I was taking that Vanguard on account. It. Yeah, I was at that Vanguard account that that Keo plan that I started. So I, I, I was I was I was at a point where I just felt I was destined for something else. And I wanted to do the Wall Street thing. I wanted to do the private equity thing. I wanted to do all of that stuff. That's what I wanted to do. All my friends were in it. I wanted to be what they were doing. And, right. and so... Um, were you tired of the running circle too? Did that get old as well? I, wa I wasn't so much tired of the running circle. I just didn't really understand how motivated I must have been because when I started coaching, I and don't please don't take this the wrong way. And, and Bob, on behalf of your son, don't take this the wrong way. I just felt it was, I felt it was glorified babysitting. Yeah, totally. All right. And, yeah. and I just, I just, I felt like, is this it? And it was self-pity, you know, in many ways. Um, 
And, and then one of one of the nights, um, we we had to go to a funeral, and um, you reminded me you were at the funeral. Yeah. And I was a young kid on the team, Rick McVoy, and and Rick's mother had passed away, and and we had gathered. It was a snowy evening. Yeah. Um, we all got into cars. Uh, probably risk management. Kind of risk somewhere. management today would be frowning on stuff like that. All these student athletes <laughs> getting into cars and driving. So we were fishtailing out towards Norristown area or somewhere like that. And we all went to the funeral. And like that was a moment where things started to change for me because I came back from the funeral and I felt like we had done something good. I felt like here I had, we rallied the guys, yeah. got them into cars, we got out there, we were supporting him. And at that moment, I, I realized, you know what? I think I could do something if it's closer to this than the actual running portion of things. And and at that moment, I kind of settled down and I just started to see what I could do uh, with coaching. And then from there, things started to change. And so for me, it's all about trying to help people to to grow, try to help people. I'm, I'm always curious to know what they're doing, what they're studying, what they're going to do. Yeah. And so I think ultimately it's, it was one of those things where I needed to, it was a glove that didn't fit in the beginning, but once I started to feel it the way I wanted it to feel and right. the things that I wanted to get out of it, I felt like it, it started to fit nicely at, over time. Wow. You know? No, I'm just curious. I mean, obviously you had such a long career. I mean, you have over a hundred sub four minute miles. Um, you won, was it six Milrose games? If I, uh... Uh, five at least. Five at least. You don't even know. That's no. how good you are. You know you're great when you're like, I can't remember how many times I won. Um, but I mean, is there one race that's most personal of all the races that you won? Um, I, I, I think the one that almost we lost the record this weekend was by far the four by mile. Okay, why? And, and there's a lot of reasons behind it. But this was back, let me, let me bring you back to the mid 80s. This was 85. This was during the time of Live Aid. This was during sure. the time where the world was kind of coming together in all their different respective um, um, careers or whatever people were doing, whether it was the music business or whether, what have you. And the athletics was no different. They, we, were, we were doing things to try and help raise money. And um, one, of the, um, one of the ventures was a journalist uh, by the name of John O'Shea out of Ireland. He worked with Goal, which was a charitable organization back then. And he was a journalist. And, and the journalists would travel with us. So like when we would travel, you'd have four or five journalists that would just come to Zurich or they would just come to Oslo or they would okay. just come to wherever. Wow. So they were always there just covering the meets and stuff. Um, and, uh, so after the race would be done, every, all the athletes were in the, in, in, in the restaurant or wherever in the hotel and we were having dinner, journalists would get access, they would come in and, and John said, I'm trying to put this relay together and I want it to be the four by mile and I want Ireland to break the world record and we're going to raise money for, um, I think it was for the Sudan area, Ethiopia okay. and all that. And you're out of Villanova at this point. I'm out of Villanova. Yeah, okay. I'm running professionally. Yeah. And, and I, I was... I was like, I'm not doing it, you know? I'm not, you know, I, I, I've only got so many races in me. I am not taking one out and taking and, and going to fly home and do it. And, wow, um, okay. And so we finally, they strong r and we decided we're all going to go. So we go. How they strong on you, by the way? I'm well, curious. look, we're doing it. You got to come. It, the Irish fraternity of, of athletes that were, there was Ray Flynn, there was Eamon Coughlin, there was Frank O'Mara, there was myself, there was a whole bunch of eyes. The elite fun. Irish runners. Yeah, basically. elite Irish runners. Twisting so, your arm. So they, they finally said, we're doing it, you're coming. Right, so reluctantly, I'm, they're, they're yeah. dragging me there and I'm, I'm kicking and screaming and I don't want to do this, you know. And, um, and I, I, will, I will tell you, it was one of the most shameful moments of my life when I look back on it because this was for some really good cause. And, uh, right. And uh, so we get there, and uh, but the story unfolds, and we get there. Uh, we they fly in. I think um, they, they had a sponsor airline, so we we just we flew in for the event. We got into the hotels. We came over to the meet, and when we were just about to warm up, we look at the stadium. There's not one person in the stadium, and I go, "This was a total waste of time. I told you we shouldn't have done this, right?" <laughs> and so we go out and we warm up, and we come back an hour. It takes about an hour to warm up. We right. came back. The stadium is full. It's packed. Wow, just like that. And all of a sudden, I go, "Oh God, now we really have to perform, right?" So I'm like, "I'm like, nah, now we got to get out there," and and like everyone showed up. Like the or Tour de France bikers came, or uh, you know uh, Sean Kelly, Stephen Roach, they all or boxing world 
championships in boxing days. It was just this incredible who's who in Ireland in time. Yes. Yeah. And this was um, we had Michal Mirahertig, who was our famous um, uh, voiceover. He was there. He was doing. And I go, what? How the how the heck did this just happen in an hour? Yeah. Right. And so we end up going out. We end up um, uh, breaking the world record that night. And uh, they charged nobody to come to the meet, but they ended up going around with white paint buckets after it, and they collected money. There was about thirty or forty thousand euro at the time, and they donated it to the char- charity. Wow. We ended up breaking the world record, and that wor- world record is still day- there today, like almost forty years later. That's incredible. You just—I right. mean, what was it about that race? I mean, do you do you remember the race? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was it, just... it, what I remember it is is more like we didn't want Eamon on the rate uh, on the on on the leadoff leg because he was in shape for about four twenty, and <laughs> and the journalist said Eamon's going to be on it. Doesn't matter, he's going to be on it. So I said, this is another why reason why we shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> Eamon, Eamon, Eamon leads off. He runs four minutes, and I will tell you, it was probably one of the greatest races I've ever seen him run. Why? Because he was not in four minute mile shape. And so you go back to like you don't have to break a world record, right? It was just because he wasn't in great shape, and he and still there's no way off. he was letting us down. And yeah, he yeah. Was, he was coming in, he and, out of his head. and he he got us off to a great start. And then from that four minutes, we just went from uh, Frank O'Mara to myself, to myself to Ray Flynn. And um, lo and behold, this weekend at Penn Relays, I'm coaching a team that came within two seconds of breaking the world record. Nobody's ever gone Kim that close. Ever. And, and it's a long time to have a record since 1985. Yeah. yeah. Ray standing next to me and he's going, do you realize how close to go? No, no, we, we've run 1547. He goes, no, we haven't. We've run 1549. <laughs> and then, and they've run 1552. And he goes, no, they haven't. They're on 1551. So all of a sudden it became, instead of me thinking it was five seconds away, it was only two seconds away. So in and, your heart, did you want him to break the record as well, coach? Well, you know, or did you we, want to we, hold we, on to we, the record we actually, as an We athlete? actually concluded <laughs> that if it had to happen, today would have been the day. Fair. And, and, and it was a, a great moment. I didn't realize they were that close. I knew they were going to run 16, under 16 minutes, which I don't think ever happened in the U.S. And, um, and so at the end of the day, it was one of those things where if I had to pick one race, and now four years later, we were given a gift. And the gift was um, a tapestry in representation of the area that we supported and helped and stuff like that. And I've always kept it because all the That's athletes so cool. signed it. Yeah. And it's in my office. And um, four years ago, we have a kid on the team, have to Strenzo. He came by way of Australia. He was at, from uh, Tigray, up in the war, um, Civil War area where it's, it's, it's really, really tough. Wow. And he walked into my office. And I've got all the Olympians up there, and I've got all the sub four minute milers up there, and he sees the tapestry, and he said, "That's my home." No way. And so all of a sudden, I began to realize, you know, when you when you get that moment in life where you know why you're supposed to be, you are where you are because you are where you are. Yeah. I had this overwhelming moment that I was meant to coach, I was meant to do this career. That's incredible. And here's a young boy that comes in. And he's coming to do engineering at Villanova. He just graduated last year with a master's in engineering. And um, he looks up at the wall, and it's the one thing that caught his eye. And he goes, that's where I'm from. Wow. And so some 40 years ago, we were running, raising money for his community and, and sending it over there. for they, were, they had famine and starvation and stuff like that. Well, stuff. Sir, that's incredible. Yeah. yeah. yeah so we are where we are. We're, we're here for a reason. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Pain Capital Management, at bebullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Pain Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 